So my name is Adriana Valencia. I work as a dietitian and a CDE at UCSD. I'm happy to see so many people here who want to learn a little bit more about carbs. So I don't have. Sure. Raise it up higher. Oh. Oh, how do I do that? Oh. I have this. Is that better? All right. <laughs> Nobody said that in my first talk, so you guys are more awake, huh? Okay. So um, just so you know, I don't have um, type 1 myself. Okay, so many of you are experts on this topic as well. Okay. So how many of you count carbs? Special. Good, good. Okay. How do you count carbs for meals and snacks? Packaging. Packaging? Packaging your total amount. Okay, you add things up. Measuring cups. All right, good. Guessing. Guessing. Yeah. Good, good, good. Some good, some good answers. I got a lot of eyeballs last time. I weigh the food. You. Wow, awesome. Now that is a star carb counter. Very good, very good. Okay, now if you don't count carbs, how do you cover for your meals? This is Dr. Edelman right here, okay? He says he doesn't count carbs. So how do you cover for your meals if you don't count carbs? Yes. You can't? <laughs> a Fresa, you guess. Okay. Good. Trial and error. Good. Get some good answers. Okay, so um, I just wanted to know, because I have a lot of people who don't count carbs, and I always wonder, well, how do you cover for your meals then? Experience says a lot about what you normally Right. We kind of eat the same things, experience. CGM. CGM can be very helpful. Good. So my goal today is that you take away at least one helpful tip from this, from this little lecture. Okay, the, I would say that the meat part of the lecture is towards the end when we talk about carb counting for fat and we talk a little bit about sugar alcohols. That's what I tend to get the most questions on. Okay, so to go back in history a little bit, how many of you guys remember learning about the GI index or exchange? Yeah. We used to teach carb counting this way. Okay, so we have this table here. Okay, it was separated. We have low GI foods. They were given a value. Right in that category, we have things like pasta, fruits, corn. Okay, we have our medium GI foods. Okay, there's their rank. We have things like rice in this example, wild rice. And then we have our high GI foods, which are things like white bread, pretzels, potatoes. Okay. All the good stuff. <laughs> so we used to tell patients before to try and avoid the foods in the a high GI group for carb counting, right? Some of you might remember that. Uh, Maya has lacked some things, but I'm wondering if it could be focus steady better. Uh, th this is just a little small. I think the next slide. I don't think it can focus anymore. Sorry. Um, I don't, and I don't know how to do that. Sorry. I think it's just it's just a photo, so my photo is a little small. Okay, we're good now? Okay, so they, we started using this in about 1984, so it was a while ago, and that's when they started doing studies, okay, on the GI index, and that was why we started using it, this is when we started using it for carb counting. So we started following the GI index, um, that's kind of what we, we would use as our base, but it was more based on the composition of food, such as starchy foods versus sugary foods. So starch was thought to absorb much slower, okay, which meant that it would give you a smaller spike in blood sugar, so we thought. And sugars such, such as lactose and glucose was thought to absorb much quicker and would therefore cause a faster blood sugar spike. This is where that whole premise came from. So why do you think we don't use this system anymore? It doesn't work. That's right. So I still get a lot of questions about this even now. So when you cook, the way that you prepare a food, the way that you process a food, like you see here, like if you cooked something like okra, that would completely change the GI score, okay? So when you cook or modify a food, that changes that number for you. The other thing is when these studies were conducted, they were done on those single foods. Most of us don't eat just a big bowl of potato, 
right? We add other things to it. So when you're having a mixed meal like you see here with protein and fat, that completely alters the GI level or the GI number as well. Okay, so that's why we don't use that anymore. So now, for the current recommendations from the ADA, is that we look at the total amount of carbs. Okay, so we don't really, we don't look at the source as much like the sugar and starch as we did with the GI. So this is where we come up with our carb counting now. This is where all of our recommendations now come from. So what do you think makes carb counting so difficult? What do you guys think? Time. Time takes a while, yes? Sometimes just trying to eyeball the proportions when you don't have the measuring cups. Yeah. Difficult. It's difficult to visualize things. Yeah, good. Fast foods and restaurants. Added sugar, eating out. Added sugar, eating out, fast food, good. Yeah, you're right, carb counting is difficult. I'll tell you a secret, even dietitians have a hard time carb counting. Even we do. So um, there was actually a study that I found that was conducted in May of 2018. It was done um, using Central European meals, and it showed that as the size of the meal increased, so did the error of margin for the dietitians. Okay? So even we have a really hard time doing this, and we talk about this all day long. And it was especially difficult for pasta, chips, rice, and polenta. I'm sure some of you would agree that that can be a little bit more difficult to carb count. So based on the current recommendation, well, the, how the ADA recommends looking at carb counting, these are two of my very favorite apps that I recommend downloading on your phone. So unfortunately, these are only, phone, these are only for the Apple phone, but if you have an Android phone, you can go into your um, Google or Safari. You can type in their Calorie King, for example, and you can bookmark the website. So it looks just like an app. I can show you how to do that after if you need help. So I'll show you why I like these. Now the pictures are gonna be a little blurry because these are screenshots from my phone. Okay. So we have Calorie King and then we have Figwe. F-I-G-W-E-E. -E. F-I-G-W-E. So the first one is Calorie King. C-A-L-O-R-I-E King. Do you guys remember those little books? There it is, but it's an app form now. It's the same thing. Do I have the books? No, you can get them on Amazon and Target though. You can still purchase them. So we have Calorie King, and then the second one that I like is called Figwe, F-I-G-W-E-E. -E. They're both free. Okay, I'm gonna show you why I like them. So like I said, this is gonna be a little hard to read, it's just a screenshot. So what I like about Calorie King is you don't have to input your name, your age, your weight, or anything. You can just search, it has a very large database of 250,000 foods plus. So you can go in there and search for something like this one. I looked up watermelon, okay? And on the very top comes up watermelon. And if you click on that, you can change the serving size on the top and then it will tell you the carb amount that it has. So you do still have to be aware of portions, right? This is also a really great app for eating out. So you can type in food, you can type in like Rubio's and you'll get almost the entire menu there. Okay. And, and the information on this app is very accurate. Okay. So you said you can modify the serving size? So you click on the food, like watermelon. Yeah. When you click on there, there's a drop down menu that says one wedge, one ounce, one cup. Okay. So you modify that on the top and then from there it changes the nutrition label so that you can see what it will, if I have a cup of watermelon, that is X amount of grams. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's in a very, I love it because it's easy to use, it's free, and it has a really large database. Do they have fiber? They do, they do. And you know what, I'll, sorry, I'll take questions at the end just so we can go, but, but yes, it does have fiber listed. Okay. My other favorite app is called Figwe. That's the one I mentioned to you, F-I-G-W-E-E. -E. Let me show you why I like it. So with this one, you do have to sign up with an email, and that's it. And then when you log in, my favorite food to show people is hash browns. Okay. So we have a plate of hash browns here. And I know it's a little hard to see, it's a, it's a screenshot. So see how the plate has like a serving there of, a hash, of hash browns? Well, it's not one serving, but it has an amount. If you look on the total carbs there on the corner, 
it shows that the total carbs for this plate is 40.4, okay? And as you can see on the corner right here, there's a little arrow. Can you guys see that? If you click on that little arrow, you can move it up and down, and that changes the serving, the portion on the plate. The view. Okay, so you can see how the hash browns are much larger on this bigger plate. So that plate is 101 grams of carb. That one. Okay. So I had somebody earlier say, but it says the serving size is one. And what this means is that's for the whole plate it's saying. Okay, it's not saying, so when it says, so the serving is basically whatever you put on the plate. Okay, so whatever that's listed there, that's what the label is for. But I mean, how many of you would have guessed that was 101 grams of carb? That's pretty tricky, right? So this is, this is not as accurate as using a scale, right, or using cups, but it gives you that visual component. It makes the eyeballing thing that some of us do a little better, right? And if you're going out to eat at someone's home, or you're eating out and you can't find anything that's comparable to it, this is a really good alternative. This database is not as large as Calorie King, but I do really like the visual component of it. Now, using measuring cups, as was mentioned in scales, is great. Okay. Now, I always tell my patients, if you're starting to carb count or you're getting back into the habit of it, when you're at home, you don't have to make anything different. But it would be ideal for you to take those cups out so that you can start to visually you can become a little bit better at visualizing. I have a lot of patients who I ask them to write down what they eat. And they'll write down one cup of Cheerios. And then I take out my measuring cups and I'm like, so you had about one cup? And they're like, oh, actually it was like two to three. Right, most of us completely underestimate how much we eat. So that's gonna completely throw off your carb counting. So in this example, for visual representation, one cup is about the size of a female, okay, our, our, um, I can't, not wrist, fist. Fist. fist, thank you, <laughs> of our fist, which is the same as about a baseball, okay? And we can see about a quarter of a cup is an egg, two tablespoons is a golf ball. So you can find representations like this online so that when you go out, you can be, feel more comfortable estimating your carbs. Okay. Now, do you cover differently for meals that are high in fat? Okay, how do you cover differently? Sorry, go ahead. How? You stack away insulin. Stacking? No, not stacking. I do it in two parts. Two parts, okay. So like a, a different, like a dual wave or combo wave almost? Okay, good. So most of you shook your head yes when I said that. Okay. So typically it is recommended when you're having a meal that's high in fat to change the way that you carb count for that, okay? And this can be tricky and we're gonna talk about it. So why do we do this? Because fat stays in our stomach much longer than carbs do. So for example, how many of you guys had a roll at lunch? Okay, how many of you guys put butter on that roll? Right? So, do you think that roll with butter has the same amount of carbs as the roll without butter? Yep. Yep. So, well, this, does, this is, but it metabolizes different. Perfect, right? So while you look at that roll and think that roll probably is about 22 grams of carb, and you put the butter, well, butter is a fat, it wouldn't change the carbs, but actually you do have to modify the amount that you give for that because you added in that extra fat. And those butter roll, those butter dollops were pretty big, right? So, like I mentioned, you have a delay in gastric emptying, which affects the way that, that, this, that the food is gonna be absorbed into your system. So usually with a high fat meal, it is recommended to give more insulin. Now I'm gonna show you two studies, okay, and we're gonna talk about them. They're a little different. Okay, oh wait, and then, but how do you figure out how much more insulin to give? That's the tricky part, right? Well, I'm supposed to give more, but how much? I have no idea. So there's this study. I was in Diabetes Care in 2016. It's got a really long name, Optimized Mealtime Insulin Dosing for Fat and Protein in Type 1. We just say the pizza study for short, okay? <laughs> it's easier to remember like that, right? So for this pizza study, they have 10 patients. They used 10 patients in the study who all had Type 1. They were given 50 grams of carb 
So we had the group that had the marinara sauce and crust, which was 273 calories, four grams of fat, and nine grams of protein. And then we have the pizza group, which is the one, of course, that we would want to be in, right? 764 calories, 44 grams of fat, and 36 grams of protein, okay? So they found that doing this in this study, that insulin needed to be increased by 65%, plus or minus 10%, in a combo bolus of 3070. Do you guys know what that combo bolus means? Does anybody, do you guys know, does that make sense when I say that? Yes. Okay, so, so, co so combo bolus is just like dual wave, which is something you can use in an insulin pump, okay? Both of these studies were done on patients with insulin pumps. You don't need to have an insulin pump in any way. That's not what I want you to take away from this, okay? But just know, so when you give a bolus of 30 to 70%, what it does is it gives 30% of your insulin at that, it delivers it at that time, and then usually over about two hours, it gives the rest, the 70% later, okay? You, and you can change it, 100% correct. Most pumps come preset 50, 50, two hours, but you can modify this if you'd like. Questions at the end, okay? So now you'll notice, when I saw this, I thought, oh my gosh, 65% is a lot. Okay, I would not feel comfortable telling my patients to do 65%. And if you notice, they had a really large range because they took the average of 10 patients. That's how they came up with the 65. But so the, the patients ranged from 17 to 124%. Okay. But the takeaway that I get from this study is that you need to dose more for fat. And the tricky thing is there is no real hard and fast rule. Okay, I had a lot of people ask me in the last one, well, how much, and I'm saying, unfortunately, there's no nine grams of fat means you need to give 2%, right? It, it, it's a little bit more difficult than that. The next study that I show you gives you a little bit more of a rule and is a little more conservative. Um, but this shows you that everybody is different, okay? I wouldn't feel comfortable telling somebody 65%. I'd be a little more conservative, and typically we say about 20 to 30. But, you know, some people do need 65%. Some people need 100% more. It really just depends. And like I said, because this study was done in such a tiny group of 10 people, it's kind of hard to tell, right? It's sample size is tiny, right. So the other um, kind of study I wanted to show you was recently one that was presented at the American Diabetes Association Conference. Okay. So this, you're not able to find the article yet or I wasn't able to find it. But it was a, um, a presentation that I saw about the relationship between the amount of type of dietary fat, postprandial glycemia, and insulin requirements in type one. This was also a small sample size study, unfortunately. <laughs> so it was done in type one patients, and it was um, six adult patients, okay? So it's, again, small. They were given 45 amounts, or 45 grams of carb, okay? And they were given zero grams of fat, 20 grams of fat, 40 grams of fat, and 60 grams of fat. So kind of a little different. And they all had insulin pumps as well, as I mentioned earlier. And they used a 50-50. Remember how the other one was 30-70? Was um, this one is 50-50 over two hours. This is where we typically tell people to start out when they're starting to use their extended or combo bolus. So I went online and found, I went on McDonald's and found these different photos to show you, well, what does 20 grams of fat look like? Now, no, the carbs on all these are different. They're not all the 40, um, they're not 45 grams, but I just wanted to show you what the fat looked like. So for 20 grams of fat, which is a little sausage McMuffin here, okay, they found that it was recommended to increase your bolus amount by 9%. So in this example, if I have 29 grams of carb in this sandwich, multiply by 0.09, right, because we convert that over, that would be about, two, so it's 2.61 grams. So you can say you can cover, this sandwich would go from 29 grams of carb to 31 grams of carb. So not a huge, huge difference right, in this example. But if your ratio is pretty tight, this might be an extra unit for you. Does the math make sense on this? So now we have 40 grams of fat, which is a bacon smokehouse burger, okay? 
So the carbs on this sandwich are 62. Oh, I didn't fix that one. Sorry. So basically what you have to do is the amount of grams of fat is 45. They recommended giving a 12% increase. Okay, so you would do 45 times 0.12 and get 7.44. I made a mistake on this slide. So you're supposed to add that to 62 grams of carb. Does that make sense? I boo-booed. So, so, what, so whatever, you take the, the fat, okay? And then you add that into the extra carb. So we have to go ahead and add an extra about eight units to our 62 grams of carb. I messed that bottom part up. Okay. Now, what about 60 grams of fat? So that's a double smokehouse burger. So for 60 grams, it was recommended to give a 30% increase. So we're gonna take our 67 grams of fat times 0 0.30, and we're gonna cover for about 83 grams of fat. I'm sorry, 83 grams of carb. So you can see in this study here, in this photo, it shows you the difference when you have a meal that is zero grams of fat, 20, 40, or 60. You can see that they all peak a little differently. So basically the takeaway is when you're having something that's high in fat, you have to give some more insulin. And everybody's gonna be a little different and it's different with different amounts of fat. Now, what about if you're doing mealtime injections? It makes it a little trickier, right? Like I said, you don't have to have a pump if you're doing injections with a syringe or a pen. What would be ideal for you to do in this example? Two shots. Two shots, right? So you could give two injections, so you may want to set an alarm on your phone to remind you two hours later to give the, you know, the other 50% of your insulin, for example. It's, a little, it's obviously a little harder to do, right? Because you have to remember and want to do two different injections but that's really the best way that you'd mimic the effect of the pump. Now, what if you have a product that has sugar alcohol? Do you carb count differently? Yes. No, yes, no? Yes. Okay, get some different answers. And somebody pulled out a bar that they were giving out earlier. Okay, so sugar alcohols are naturally occurring. That's why you see them in a lot of products when they say that they're all natural because right, they come from foods like grapes, melon, and cheese, for example. And they tend, on the, on the label, you'll see them written in an O-L ending, like erythritol, sorbitol, and mannitol. Does that sound familiar to some of you on the ingredients list? Yep. And they tend to be in sugar-free chocolates. We tend to find them in, sugar, in like, things like sugar-free syrup or bar Atkins bars and ice cream. Okay. Some people get a little bit of GI discomfort with these products, basically diarrhea, okay? Not everybody gets that, but some people can kind of get a little bit of cramps, um, but it depends. So when you have sugar alcohol, you'll notice here in the label, we have total carbs. A lot of the products will give you a little circle in the front, and it will say net carbs of three. You think, oh my gosh, I'm not even gonna get a blood sugar spike with three grams. But what they do on these products is they tend to subtract out all of the sugar alcohol and all of the fiber. Okay. So actually, when you have sugar alcohol, your body absorbs about half of that. Okay. So in this example, we have, how many grams of carbon do we have for these two cookies? 17, okay? So this product, what would be ideal to do would be to go to the sugar alcohol section, which says how many there? Eight. Eight, and you divide that by two, which is four, and you would subtract that from 17, and that would give you your net carbs. Now, I know you're gonna ask me about fiber. Is that what you were thinking? So, in, an, in an, some of these products, you'll see, like I mentioned, that little thing in the corner that has the fiber and the sugar alcohol out. Fiber can be a little bit controversial, but to be safe, we usually recommend for fiber, if the product is five grams of fiber or more, you take whatever that number is, and divide it by two, then subtract it from the total carb. So if there's like three grams of fiber in there, it basically means you don't touch it. You don't subtract it. So if a product has five grams or more of the total fiber, you take that value, let's just say it's six, divide that by two, which would give us three, then you subtract that from the total carb. 
So for the sugar alcohol, whatever it is, you can divide by two and subtract. In some products, that makes a huge difference for the sugar alcohols. And a lot of the high fiber products, like it can, make, it can make a pretty big difference with all of the low carb bars. Like we were looking at one earlier somebody had, and it said on the front it had four grams of net carb. When we calculated out, it was 16. So that's a pretty big difference. So it's very important to be aware with the, with the product, with the labeling, it can be really difficult when they do the net. Okay, so for sugar alcohol, divide by two, subtract. And then when we do a fiber, we do if it's five or more, we can divide and then subtract. And that's whether or not it has a sugar alcohol in it? That's whether or not, yeah, this fiber thing carries along, thank you for everything, okay? okay so, so, hold on, so, oh. so now, I have a lot of people who ask, well, carb counting can be really difficult, especially for things like mixed meals, okay, right? Like casseroles and soups can be kind of tricky. Most of us, when we cook something, tend to make things kind of the same, right? Like I make my chicken soup kind of the same every time, right? I make my casserole kind of the same. So I have an example here of mom's lasagna, which is noodles, marinara sauce, ground beef, whole milk ricotta, and tons of cheese, okay? So that's delicious and has lots of fat. What would you do for carb counting here? Yes. <laughs> Guess? <laughs> Yes, so guessing is what I usually hear. And also you can always look on your Calorie King app for like a Stouffer's lasagna to give you somewhere to start as well, right? But yes, most people would guess, 100%. Okay. So what would be recommended to do would be ideally to keep track of this meal. So either on a, a free app on your phone, because we always have our phones with us, or in a little notepad, you could write down mom's lasagna Okay, because mom makes it the same every time. And you could put your blood sugar before you ate the lasagna was example 189, okay? Let's just say that you counted that for 70 grams of carb. And in this example, if my ratio is one to 10, I would be seven units, okay? This is just an example. So, and then you checked your blood sugar two hours later and it was 278. What does that mean? You didn't give enough, you needed more, right? True, so there could be multiple things going on here, correct. So most of the time you would think, okay, maybe I need to give more than seven units. When I go back to my mom's house and eat that lasagna, am I gonna remember that I gave seven units? No. No, right? So that's why it's good to write it down. So next time you go, you can look in your little app or your little notepad and say, there's mom's lasagna, last time I gave seven, I'm gonna try nine or 10 and see what happens, okay? This is really, the best thing to do because everybody's body is different and with these mixed meals, it makes it a little bit, it makes it even harder, even more difficult for carb counting. Okay, so this is a, the best way I tell patients to keep track of what they eat. Cause like somebody said, you know, you do things based on experience, right? And this is using your experience and all your tools. But like I said, the good thing is you can refer back to this cause you're not gonna remember when you go back and eat the lasagna that you gave seven units, right? So this is, um, would be ideal, especially with mixed things, mixed meals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so okay, let me just, so I will answer that question. So this is my references and it has this study on here. Okay, so I can take questions now. So the question was, if you were eating mom's lasagna and you were 278, what would you do then? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'd do two shots, like two units. So it depends on what your ratio, it depends if you have a pump, you could go into the pump and put your high blood sugar and it would give you a correction. Okay, the problem is if you give another injection and it's too close, what could end up happening? Yeah. You stack your insulin, you end up having a low. And there's a lot of fat, you're gonna have, you're gonna have a delay of absorption as well. So it, I can't tell you like, oh, you should give an extra two units if it's 278, because everybody's different. But if you had a high blood sugar and you had a Dexcom and, or any CGM and it said you were rising still, you may want to give another one or two units conservatively. I wouldn't give another seven units for this meal, right? Because it's already had time to digest and pass. But it's, it's, everybody's body's different. There's, like I said, the hard thing is there's no hard and fast rule with that. Question? So my question is, in both of those studies, we already said we only have a small sample size. 
Right. Right. So how much of that correction is actually for the fat versus for the extra Right. So good question. The thing, the, the premise of that whole giving more for the absorption delay is more because of the, the way that the fat sits in our stomach is more what affects the, the delay versus the protein. But typically when foods are higher in fat, what are they also higher in? Protein. So it kind of goes hand in hand together. But I would more look at the fat. Don't get too complicated with the protein section because then you're going to drive yourself crazy. Well, and that's what I'm thinking is that if I'm correcting for, for protein already and then I also start correcting for fat, that might, besides getting complicated, I might be over Right, so I would just stick with looking at the fat because that's what's going to affect the time that it sits in your stomach much more than with the protein only. And like I said, a lot of the foods that are higher in fat also tend to be higher in protein, so they kind of go hand in hand. Now, if you have um, gastroparesis, which somebody asked me about earlier, it's going to completely change the absorption as well, right? And you may want to consider if you have your pump doing a different percent. Instead of the 50-50 or 70-30, your percentage would probably be different. Uh, so oh, hold on. Was, mm -hmm. When we're giving all this discussion to fat, uh, are we interested in fat because it requires more insulin to metabolize the fat or because the fat is slowing the process, it's uh, sticking to the, the fat or something? It's more that it delays the process. And, it all, and if you look at carb counting overall, what, what, like if you look at a plate of chicken and asparagus and salad, you look at that and think, oh, that's low carb, right? What happens if you don't give any insulin for that? you'll probably end up going high, right? What I just told you was not a meal that's high in fat. You're thinking, well, what the heck? Like, all that was low fat. I should have been fine. But some of those, basically what our body does is when you don't have any carbs, when you have this, like, lower fat meal like I just mentioned, your body will convert some of that over to glucose, mm -hmm. right? Because it is calories. Mm -hmm. And that makes it tricky is we don't know how much. And it's different for you, and it's different for you, and it's depending on the meal you have as well. So that's what makes it a little bit more complex. But in terms of this, what the studies I showed you, it was more the delay because of the fat itself and the way that it sits in the stomach. Okay. So that's the hard thing is there is no like rule. Like we know one carb serving is 15 grams, but it's not like that when we talk about fat. Yeah, good question. So sometimes I, I found myself, before I reached the 278, because you see the trending up, mm -hmm. I started to take a walk. Yeah. And that walk can from like, going up higher, yeah. yeah. But what's the safe time to start to walk? Is it after the insulin injection time, half an hour, or is it after the starting of the meal? Half so an hour? the question is that if you see your blood sugar um, at 278 with the lasagna, and you see you're going up, one thing that you can do is go for a walk, right? And walking really helps uptake the glucose into our muscles. Then the second part of the question was, when is it safe to walk? Yeah. So she's saying, so basically, when is it safe to walk? You know, if your blood sugar is 278, I'm not worried if you're going to go for a walk that you're going to go low, no, right? No, so if, if you are going to be, anytime you, like somebody mentioned earlier in the exercise um, talk, going for a walk is just should help you just reduce that down. There is no, not that I know of, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, oh, you need to wait 30 minutes after eating that or not. I mean, if you see that you're going high already, going for a walk would help, would help bring that down. And if you sat on the couch for 30 minutes and then we're gonna go for a walk, what would end up happening most of the time? You would never end up going for that walk, okay? <laughs> right? Most people, not everybody, but people are like, oh, forget it. It's, you know? So if, if you see that your blood sugar is starting to go up, I would, if you wanted to go for a walk, go for it. Especially when you're 278, you're not probably gonna go low. Yeah. But frequently, if it's that high, exercise can cause it to go high. It depends on the type of activity. Like somebody, like we were talking about earlier in the exercise talk. Typically a walk, because of the intensity, wouldn't cause an increase. Yes, good question. Okay. So if you have that and then we're going to go do something like intense, like if I was going to go play a basketball game against other people, then possibly I could go, I could see the opposite. But for a walk, you should be all good. Good question. Any other questions? How do you factor in like the kind of glass of wine? 
Ah, somebody else asked me about alcohol earlier. Alcohol is a little tricky. Um, if you are having something like wine, we typically say that's neutral. Okay, you don't add that to carbs. If you're having a beer like an IPA, which we have a lot of in San Diego, those have quite a bit of carbs. Okay, so a bottle of an IPA beer can be maybe 25, 30, 25, 20, 25 we would say. So you would carb count that, okay, and give for that beer. Now, if you're having like shots of alcohol or like Diet Coke and rum, you're actually more likely to have issues with a low, so we would not want to cover for any of that alcohol. We actually prefer people write a little higher when they're going out to drink, like if you go to the bar and you're having the, the beverages, like, like I said, like shots or Diet Coke and rum. So alcohol can be a little tricky. Okay, everybody's a little different, and every type of alcohol is a little different too. Mm -hmm. With Calories King, um, so I'm assuming it's Calorie King's data about food that yeah. I didn't know if you had any if I don't know that particular app. There's so many apps out there, and whatever app you have that you like to use is great. These are just the ones that I like because the database is, is large. But yeah, if you like that one and, it's, and it, it has some kind of partnership, I'm sure the database they use is through Calorie King. Oh, you're talking about the Jocelyn app. The Jocelyn app. Yeah, and there's, there's other apps like, um, that let you log your calories. And like there's Gluco, I'm, no, not Gluco. Um, there's My Sugar Tracker that lets you log different things in like activity. So there's lots of different apps that you can use to pair both. This is just a simple like calorie carb lookup. Is there an app that you can actually add the carbs that you're having for a meal? Oh, you mean add them up in there? Yes, say you're having you know, like an apple and a bowl of soup. It would be more the trackers. Or do you have to add separate So the, for Calorie King, you couldn't do that. But a lot of the tracker apps that you can track on, like Fitness Pal, Fujikate, um, those, you, you, it does add up for the whole meal. Yeah, but that's more going to be a tracker, which are great. But you have to input your sex, your age, your height, your weight. It's more, that's more like where you log everything in. So it depends. That's a great thing to do for carb counting, too. Just mo a lot of my patients won't keep a log like that. Uh -huh. So trying to figure out what, but you don't know the sugars, what is it, you kind of are guessing, okay, well, there might be 100 grams of carbs in this pastry. How do you, is there any way of judging that? So standard? that's where I would go and go, like if I was eating a pastry, I would go into, the, into Google or my calorie king and put in like something like Danish to help give me a base of that pastry. But you're right, there's going to be times when you go out of the country or when you eat something completely unfamiliar that you're not sure. But to kind of do better than just guess, looking up at least gives you some estimation. So like if you're eating a pastry, maybe look up a croissant. You know, if it had, a, if it had some kind of um, something like sweet on it, you might be like, okay, well, the croissant is 60. I can see it has like some sugary thing on top. Let me say about 75. So at least you're still being a little bit more accurate than just completely guessing. Right? Like you said, experience also makes a huge difference as well. And then, of course, there had to be added sugar because they just sent my blood sugar to the fruit. And then they have a lot of extra fat sometimes, those pastries, right? So we have to take... So it's, it's right. So then it, it's going to absorb differently as well. So it is tricky. And that's what makes this whole thing with carb counting hard is, like I said, there's not hard and fast rules for a lot of these things, like the fat. Like I showed you these two studies that showed a pretty big range. But it still kind of gives you a point of where to start and makes us more aware that, oh, we do need to start thinking about these higher fat meals differently. Mm -hmm. That helps a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to revisit the, the no carb, or really, you know, where there's times I go, okay, we hike, and I don't want a lot of insulin on board. Say that again, I'm sorry? Like, if I'm hiking, I don't want a lot of insulin on board. Maybe I'll have just salad for lunch. And I'm, I understand that you're saying there's no rules. Where do you even start? Because I'll notice if I take insulin, even a small amount, 
probably want to have it delayed because because of the hike. Break. Well, it takes a little bit for the food. I mean, I don't want to necessarily have the bolus go in immediately because it seems to take a while for the salad to absorb because it's already low carb. But if I do nothing, mm -hmm. it'll go up. You know, I'm just right. How do you start when you want to start? experimenting on how to a lot of it in the beginning is going to be trial and error yeah. so you so you let's just say you just told me oh I already know that when I give for my salad and I give it right away I go really high later so maybe when you cover for your salad trying to give a little more maybe do you, if you have an insulin pump you could try a little bit of an extended maybe you could do like an 80 20 right so it I always tell people to be a little more conservative because you don't want to go low, especially if you don't have a CGM where you can be watching a trend narrow. But you already made an observation with how it works for the salad. So you know for you, if I cover this for 20 grams of carbs, I'm just having a chicken salad with some, with, some, with some veggies, it doesn't work. Maybe try next time doing, like I said, a split. Seeing if that helps a little. But a lot of it, unfortunately, is trial and error. And that's why I was mentioning at the end that keeping a, like a, a track of what you're doing really does help. Because it's really hard to remember with all the things that we eat and we do, what to, how to dose too. But yeah, that's what makes it a little tricky. But you already have made some observations. So like I said, I would be a little bit conservative though, to start with. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do you figure out the veggie soup, uh, carbs in a veggie soup? What would you guys do? Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you guys for coming. Thank <laughs> you. I happen to know with the tandem if I take it and extend.